data disaster story brought to you by the Data Roundtable. Today's guest is Jim Harris. You can see Jim is the blogger in chief at Obsessive Compulsive Data Quality. Jim has many years of experience in lots of different industries like data quality, data integration, data warehousing, business intelligence, master data management, and data governance. One of the reasons we like working with Jim is because he's a great consultant. He's a terrific speaker, and he is a great writer. He's also very active on Twitter. Make sure you follow him at OCDQ blog. Jim was also a contributor to the recent book 101 Lightbulb Moments in Data Management, Tales from the Data Roundtable. Here at Dataflux, we offered the book to anyone who would share with us their data disaster story. And today we have selected one of these stories, and we're going to ask Jim to help us solve and talk about this data disaster story. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Scott. All right, well, let's dig right in and pull up the story. Dun, dun, dun. Wanda writes, I didn't want to actually put my name in the phone directory, but in our town, if you didn't put your name in there, you actually had to pay a fee. So I decided just to put W. Bishop and my phone number. For the longest time, I would get phone calls for a Walter Bishop, some personal calls, and several collection agencies. It took me a long time to convince the collection agencies that I was not Walter Bishop and that I didn't have any idea where he currently resided or how they could track down the car that he was not making the payments on. So Jim, my first question to you is, how does something like this happen? Is it, is it a common occurrence? Actually, it is a pretty common occurrence. I had a, an experience very similar to Wander's when I lived in New Hampshire. It was actually another James Harris living in the same town as me who used my postal address and telephone number, which were freely available via our local phone directory, which I also had no choice unless I wanted to pay a fee to remove my name from. But this other James Harris used my address and phone number for an emergency room visit that resulted uh, much later in a collection agency contacting me for the non-payment of what turned out to be a few thousand dollars worth of unpaid medical expenses. Uh, of course, by the time the collection agency found me, my doppelganger had moved on and making me the only James Harris that was listed in my town. So this is a quite common uh, data quality challenge and data disaster story. So how do companies go about avoiding this type of uh, data disaster? I think this proves a, uh, serves as an excellent example of what we call false positives in data matching, which is a fancy term for matching two records together that do not actually represent the same real-world entity. So a lot of times when we rely on data matching techniques, we're looking at things like person name, postal address, and telephone number. But even when those are exactly the same, as in the case of my example where my name was spelled out in full and my full postal address and telephone number were matched against the local phone directory. Even when we have an exact match, it doesn't mean that we have identified the same real-world master data entity. So in this case, Wanda was trying to abbreviate her name as W. Bishop, and that got extrapolated out to being Walter, which is a common challenge in data matching where we might want to try to determine whether or not that initial W stands for Walter or Wanda or some other Walter net out there that we're trying to match against. So having rigid, or I shouldn't say rigid, but having more comprehensive data entry controls to collect as much information as possible and also verify as much of that information as possible at the point of entry can make our downstream data matching applications a lot more successful in resolving uh, some of these types of data disasters. All right, last question for you. How, on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is very common and, and uh, or very easy and 10 is very difficult, how hard is, is this for uh, companies to, uh, to tackle? I mean, isn't this something that, uh, that every company needs to, to look at? I would say it's an 8 on the scale of something that companies need to look at or tackle, and probably a good maybe 7 on the scale of difficulty in terms of implementing the solution. Usually the technology solution is the easy part. The much harder part, which would probably be closer to the 10 level of the scale, is, is getting people to understand that data is just a reflection or abstract description of reality. It is not exactly the same thing as reality. So even if we do a very good job with our data management, we may still have these occasional data disasters created when we have either incomplete or high quality information. In the case of my example, 
trying to represent a real-world entity, which may or may not be an effective data match. All right, that sounds great. Thanks, Jim, for the uh, information. And just to remind everyone, uh, to get a free copy of 101 Lightbulb Moments in Data Management, just go to www.dataroundtable.com, click on the big icon of the book, and tell us your disaster story, and it might be featured on an upcoming episode of the Data Disaster Story.